Hello everybody and welcome to the first episode of our podcast interview series hosted by the Centre for Manuscript and Text Cultures at the Queen's College, University of Oxford. My name is Gabriele Rota, I'm a research fellow in Classics at Queen's and today I'm very happy to be interviewing Professor James Diggle. James is Emeritus Professor of Greek and Latin and a fellow of Queen's College at the University of Cambridge. Good evening James and thank you very much for being with us today. Hey, good evening Gabriele, it's a great pleasure to speak to you. Excellent. All right, James, before we can actually start with the interview, there's one thing I should let our listeners know. This interview will consist of three consecutive sections which will be duly sent posted as we go along. So we're starting off with some general questions in section one, which will be wholly devoted to James's studies and his approach to education at the university from the perspective of a Cambridge professor. Whereas in sections two and three, the focus will be thoroughly on James's research. Section 2 will be about his work as editor-in-chief for the Cambridge Greek Lexicon, which is about to come out. And in Section 3, James will tell us all about his newest editorial work in Greek literature. Alright, James, that's all I had to say. I hope you're ready for the first question of the first section. Here it comes. If my calculations are correct, and they might be not, but if they are correct, you've been a fellow of Queen's College for 54 years. So, my question is, how has the college changed since your election in 1966? Uh, the most significant change has been in terms of numbers, both of fellows and of postgraduate students. In 1966, there were fewer than 30 fellows, uh, there are now 80 or more. And we had only a handful of postgraduates, most of them doing PhDs. We now have over 500, thanks to the proliferation of new postgraduate degrees, such as the MPhil. And as a result, we're no longer a college of middling size, but the fourth largest in the university. Uh, the second major change was the admission of women 40 years ago. Around 50% of our undergraduates are now women. It seems that all change for the best, right? Speaking of change, How's classics as a discipline at Cambridge changed over the years? In 1966, there was no Greek for beginners. Every entrant had an A-level in Greek as well as Latin, and we had more applicants to choose from. But this doesn't mean that we got better applicants than we get now. In the days when large numbers of children learned Greek and Latin at school, many drifted into classics at Cambridge because it seemed the natural continuation of the schoolwork. Many, when they got here, lost interest in the subject and found that there were tempting alternatives available. So a few switched courses immediately, and a large number changed to another tripos after part one classics. That doesn't happen now. Greek is not an easy language, and you don't begin Greek from scratch unless you are powerfully committed. You can now even begin Latin from scratch. Starting both languages at university is a formidable task. So we've had a remarkable turnaround from having a large number of applicants well trained in both languages to a smaller number, many of whom know neither. But as a consequence, the quality and commitment of applicants is higher than it was. And it's a great pleasure teaching undergraduates who are so eager to learn. <sighs> right. I know that kind of system very well, you know, as I worked as a language teaching officer at Cambridge for two years after my PhD. And yes, I agree with you. Most of the time it's great to see how much students can accomplish within such a short amount of time. And some of the times, well, some of the times it's just funny, isn't it? All right, James, if I'm allowed a more autobiographical question now. My former PhD supervisor, Stephen Oakley, was an undergraduate and then a postgraduate student in classics at Queen's, as he were director of studies there. Stephen is now Kennedy Professor of Latin, which, and I'm saying this for our listeners, is the most prestigious Latin chair at Cambridge. So, my question for you is, what is it like to end up being a colleague of a former pupil of yours? How does that feel? Uh, Stephen is more than a colleague, he's a very dear friend. He, he was one of a year of four, three of whom gained first classes, a remarkable achievement at a time when firsts were not doled out as liberally as they are now. I labelled these four the Annals Mirabilis, a label which they still jokingly use of themselves. They and I have all remained close friends. 
Uh, while I'm proud to have taught Stephen, I also take pride in having taught two others who achieved posts in the faculty. Paul Millet, the ancient historian, who changed to classics after taking part one in economics and was my first pupil in beginner's Greek. And Rupert Thompson, the philologist, who eventually became my successor at one remove as university orator. Great, that sounds like a lot of successes for Queens over the decades. Okay, James, now, if you allow a slightly unrelated question, there might be school pupils among our listeners, so let's give them something to which they can relate. By any chance, do you still remember your undergraduate admission interview at St. John's College? I should say before you answer that, before joining Queen's as a researcher and then as an official fellow, you were an undergraduate student in classics at St. John's, which, for those among our listeners who don't know, is just another Cambridge college, right? So, the undergraduate interview, James, do tell us. In those days, that is 1961, applicants spent a week in Cambridge sitting a very tough entrance examination. Not only places, but also exhibitions and scholarships were awarded on the basis of that exam. I was interviewed by the Senior Classics Fellow of St. John's, R. L. Howland, who had an interest in ancient philosophy, but was mainly celebrated for having represented England as a shot putter in the Olympics in the 1930s. The interview was a very perfunctory affair. The exam was more important. Fifteen or twenty years later, when classics teaching had declined in the state schools, the exam had to be abandoned, and the interview became more important and more rigorous. Wow, what a change. Nowadays it's only about the interview, isn't it? Okay, to continue along the same lines, if you were to give a single piece of advice to Oxbridge applicants for a degree in classics and or ancient history, what would that be? Show that you want to learn the languages because they will give you first-hand access to the literature instead of the second-hand access which is all the translations can give. And that in general you want to study classics because of the purely intellectual pleasure you will derive from it. Fantastic. I could not agree more with what you just said. So, here's another question about education. Regardless of the reasons why applicants choose to study classics at the university today, what do you think that sparks their curiosity about, say, Greek and Latin literature when they actually are at the university and they finally enter the lecture room and the lecturer starts speaking? I hope um, it's because they're aware that the Greeks and Romans produce great literature and it's the function of a good lecturer to help them to understand that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, James. And now, one last general question. Your field of research is textual criticism, right? Mainly Greek, but sometimes Latin too. Now, with the exception of very few fields of specialty, Greek-Latin scholarly bilingualism has become increasingly rare these days. So, what's your view on that? Do you think that we're just living through a transitional phase, or is it going to disappear entirely, to become extinct for good? Well, when I was planning to do a PhD, I decided that I wanted to write a commentary on some particular text, so I had to choose between Greek and Latin. I had seriously thought of Latin, in particular Plautus, the comic poet, but I chose Euripides and wrote a commentary on a fragmentary play Python under the supervision of the Regis Professor of Greek, Dennis Page, and that prompted me to continue to specialise in Greek, and I soon afterwards decided to undertake a new critical edition of all the surviving plays of Euripides. Now, you, you ask if scholarly bilingualism, that is, equal competence in Greek and Latin at the highest levels of scholarship, is possible these days? Yeah, not necessarily the highest possible level, but you see what I mean, right? You remember what Hausmann said on this subject? Before his election to the chair of Latin at University College London in 1892, Hausmann wrote as much on Greek as on Latin. After 1892, he wrote little on Greek, and when asked why, he replied, I found that I could not attain to excellence in both. He claimed that excellence in both had been attained by only two English scholars, Richard Bentley and Jeremy Markland. 
I make no claim to equal excellence in Latin, but I've always tried to keep up my Latin, so I've lectured on Latin subjects regularly and published on Latin authors, particularly Ovid and Catullus. One reason I took on the post of university orator was that it gave me an excuse not only for composing in Latin, which I've always enjoyed doing, but also for continuing to read Latin prose, in particular Cicero. Mark London Bentley, what a nice way of concluding our first section, James. Thank you very much again. Okay, let's talk about Lexica now. And we're talking about Lexica, James, because the long-awaited publication of the Cambridge Greek Lexicon is imminent, and you are editor-in-chief, right? So, here's my question for you. Why was it felt that there was a need for a new lexicon in the first place, and for whom is the Cambridge Greek Lexicon chiefly designed? To explain the purpose and nature of the lexicon, I need to go back to its origins and say something of the ways in which it has evolved over the years. It began with John Chadwick. John Chadwick is best known for his collaboration with Michael Bentris on the decipherment of Linear B, but before that, as a young man, he'd served for six years on the editorial staff of the Oxford Latin Dictionary, and towards the end of his life he returned to lexicography. He was appointed to a committee overseeing the publication of a revised supplement to Little and Scott's Greek lexicon. And this prompted him to write his final work, Lexicographica Graica, 1996, in which he demonstrated some of the inadequacies in the content and method of Little and Scott by examining around 80 words and showing how the job could have been done so much better. In 1997, he persuaded the Faculty Board of Classics in Cambridge to oversee a project to revise the abridged version of Little and Scott. So, what is Little and Scott, and what is this abridged version? The original lexicon was published in 1843, and it's been continuously revised and is now in the ninth edition. But as long ago as 1889, an abridged version was published. And this abridged version has been continuously in print for over 130 years and has never been revised. And yet, this abridged version remains the Greek dictionary most commonly used by students in English schools and universities. An editor was appointed to undertake this revision, and I was asked to chair an advisory committee. It was hoped that the project might be completed within five years. But as soon as work began, it became clear that the plan as originally conceived was unworkable. The abridged 1889 lexicon couldn't be revised, it would have to be completely rewritten. Following John Chadwick's sudden death in 1998, I suggested to the faculty board that we should compile a new and independent lexicon. This would still be of intermediate size and designed primarily to meet the needs of modern students, but it would also be of interest to scholars insofar as it would be based upon a fresh reading of the Greek texts and on principles differing from those of Lilden and Scott. It was originally planned as a volume of 1,200 pages, but it's finally grown to over 1,500 and will be published in two volumes. The abridged lexicon has 900 pages, so we are larger by about 70%. Fantastic, James. And uh, as a follow-up question, does the lexicon cover the whole range of Greek literature or just a portion of it? No, the coverage extends from Homer to the early 2nd century AD, ending with Plutarch's Lives. We include all the major authors who fall within that period, and some minor ones, and many new texts unknown to Little and Scott, such as Sappho and Menander, texts which have turned up on papyri in recent years. In all, we feature about 37,000 Greek words used by about 90 authors. That was all crystal clear. Thanks a lot, James. Now, let me get back to something you said earlier in your answer. You said that the Cambridge Greek lexicon differs in methodology from Liddell and Scott. In what ways exactly? First, we don't organize entries according to chronological or grammatical criteria as Liddell and Scott normally do. 
In other words, we don't automatically start with Homer or with the active voice before getting to the middle or passive or put constructions with the accusative before constructions with the genitive or dative. Instead, we organize entries according to meaning. We aim to show the developing senses of words and the relationships between those senses. So we begin with the root sense of a word, which may well not appear in the earliest author who uses that word, but in a later author. And then in numbered sections, we trace the application of that word in the different contexts in which it appears. Second, in addition to offering bare translations, we give explanatory definitions. What's the difference, you may be wondering, between a definition and a translation? A definition describes the general sense of a word, and it may be applicable to a word in a variety of contexts. A translation reflects the meaning of a word in a specific context. On the page, we make a visual distinction between these two by giving the definition in Roman font, the translation in bold. Let me find an example, one which illustrates both our use of definitional phrases and the way we trace developing senses. Here's the adjective kalos. If someone asks you to say what kalos means in one English word, you'll probably say beautiful. Yep, I would say that. Fair enough. But you need to consider what kinds of noun the adjective is applied to, and whether it's necessary to introduce other translations that suit it better. And once you look at the word in its contexts, you can see how many different shades of meaning it can have. So, section one begins with a definition in Roman font, beautiful in appearance. This is the root sense, the sense from which all other senses are derived. We list the subjects to which the adjective in this sense is applied. Of men, women, deities, animals, their bodies. Three translation words are offered in bold font. Not just beautiful, but also handsome and good looking. Then in section two, we bring in a different type of noun. Of places, features of the natural world. The original definition, beautiful in appearance, is still applicable, but not all of the original translations will suit, so we bring in a different one. Beautiful, fair. Then in section three, we move from natural things to created things. Of created things, such as clothes, weapons, buildings, with the translations beautiful, handsome, fine. Eventually, we move away from beauty altogether to a more general sense, for which the rather elaborate explanatory definition reads, as a term of general commendation of things or circumstances, good in terms of quality, practical usefulness, or capacity to satisfy or give pleasure. And here we offer the translations good, excellent, fine, Finally, when we reach section 9, we find that we've moved to something decidedly new, when the adjective acquires a moral connotation, in application to things said or done, where the translations are good, noble, honourable, fitting, proper. Fantastic. That was a very helpful hands-on approach. Thanks a lot, James. In fact, I quite liked your case study with Kalos. Why don't we do another one? Why don't you tell us about one word that you found particularly problematic as you were working on the Cambridge Greek lexicon, and uh, why don't you tell us about how you tackled that word precisely? Yes, I'll take the verb echo, one of the commonest Greek verbs, whose basic senses are have and hold. Our entry for this verb occupies three and a half columns and runs to 55 numbered sections. If a verb has as many applications as this, you need to provide the reader with signposts to show how you've organized the material, to show that you've organized the numbered sections in groups, to show that these groups follow logically one from the other. So, at the beginning of the entry, we give an introductory summary of the groups of sections. Sections 1 to 3 hold by physical context. From the physical, we move to the less physical in section four. Hold in one's possession. Then, when we get to section 15, we've come to the non-physical, as for example in the expressions 
have thoughts or have consequences. And you'll notice that this development is marked by a shift of sense from whole to have. There's also a distinct group, beginning with section 29, in which the sense is hold back, constrain, restrain. And finally, there's a group of intransitive uses and a group of senses in the middle voice. Now, this introductory summary makes it easier for the reader to navigate through what is a very long and complex article. If you compare our treatment with that of Little and Scott, you will find there several columns of densely packed material with little to guide you through it. The labyrinth of Minos was more easily penetrable than many an article of Little and Scott. An echo is certainly the labyrinth, right? So thanks a lot for getting us out of it. Okay, now if I'm allowed a more technical question, Liddell and Scott give precise reference to the passages they quote or refer to, whereas the abridged lexicon omits quotations or references altogether. So I was wondering, between these two extremes, what is your practice in the Cambridge Greek lexicon? We don't give precise references to specific passages, like Euripides Media 245, but use author abbreviations alone. For Euripides, for example, simply capital E. And for the most part, we don't give Greek quotations. The omission of specific references and the omission of Greek quotations may seem surprising, and perhaps it is our most controversial change from Little and Scott. So let me briefly explain our reasons. If you cite a specific passage to illustrate a word or usage, you run the risk by being selective of giving a partial or distorted picture. And if you cite such a passage without translating it, as Little and Scott often do, you're doing no favours to the learner. By omitting specific references and quotations, we gain a great deal of additional space for material of a more helpful kind. We can refer to a much wider range of passages, and we can give much more detail about the contexts. Yeah, that's a pretty big change, and I guess that people will find it controversial, but I mean, the way you explained it to me, I must say that I'm totally convinced, James. Okay, let's move on to something more spicy now, let's talk about words. So, James, what is your policy over the words that Little and Scott are rather coy of translating or explaining? For example, you know, the obscenities in Aristophanes' comedies. Those kind of words that you look up in the LSJ, hoping to find the English translation and you get the Latin translation instead. You look that up in the Latin dictionary, hoping to find the English translation, and you get the Greek word from which you have started. So at that point, it's a little bit like running in circles, you know? Anyway, sorry for being a bit long-winded. I hope I've made myself clear at least. So what would you like to say about those unspeakable words? <laughs> yes, we use contemporary English, even for the words which brought a blush to Victorian cheeks. Little and Scott could have claimed, in the words of Edward Gibbon, My English is chaste, and all licentious passages are left in the obscurity of a learned language. We spur no blushes. We don't translate Hesdor as ease oneself, do one's need. We define it as to defecate, and translate it as to shit. And we don't translate like as door as to wench, but define it as perform fellatio and translate it by an expression which is so crude that I'd better leave it on the printed page. Fair enough. Well, I guess it's best to avoid the explicit content sigma altogether then. Okay, James, now I'm about to ask you a very straightforward question that you might not like. Anyway, here it comes. Do you believe that the Cambridge Greek lexicon is going to replace Little and Scott? No, it's not designed to do that. Little and Scott, for all its deficiencies, contains a wider range of material, such as inscriptions, documentary papyri, minor texts which we haven't covered. It will continue to be an indispensable work of reference for the scholar. That sounds very reasonable. Okay, moving on to more practical matters. Have you ever come to a point, while working on the Cambridge Greek lexicon, when you stopped and thought, oh gosh, we're never going to finish this, or 
this is really taking too much time. And if so, how did you get around the problem? Yes, a project that was originally designed to be completed by one person in five years has taken 24. For some of its duration, has occupied five full-time editors and has necessitated the raising of huge financial support. It was because of the very real danger that we would never finish it that I decided 15 years or more ago to devote all of my own time to it. Yeah, you must be really relieved now that the lexicon is speeding towards publication and, you know, excited about the things you're going to do next, of course. But we're going to talk about the future of Professor James Deagle later in this interview. Now let's talk about his past. The Cambridge Greek Lexicon James is not your first collaborative project. So could you tell us about your collaboration with Frank Goodyear in editing the obscure late Latin poet Flavius Corippus? As I mentioned earlier, when I became a graduate student, I was keen to keep up my Latin. So I asked Frank Goodyear, the classical fellow at Queen's, to suggest a text I might work on. He suggested the Johannes of Corippus, on which he'd published some emendations. This poem, from the 6th century AD, describes the campaigns fought against the Moors in North Africa by a lieutenant of Justinian called Johannes. Its literary interest is small, its historical interest a little larger. It's preserved in a single and very corrupt manuscript, so offers plenty of scope for textual emendation. On the day of my election to a research fellowship at Queen's, Frank opened a bottle of wine, and we drank not only to my good fortune, but also to his, because he'd just been appointed to the chair of Latin at Bedford College, London. After a few glasses, we decided to edit the Johannes together, and the edition was published by CUP in 1970. It was not without faults, but it did have the effect of bringing this poem to wider notice. And in the years which followed, the study of Corippus has flourished, and more has been written on his text and interpretation since 1970 than in all the years between then and the discovery of the manuscript of the poem in 1820. Fantastic. I would like to remind our listeners that Frank Goodyear was Professor Oakley's Doctor of Supervisor, so in a way that's how it all comes together. Okay, James, you and Goodyear also published the academic papers of A. E. Hausmann, whom we mentioned earlier in this interview. Hausmann was a titan in the field of Latin textual criticism, so would you say that Hausmann's insightful and rigorous scholarship had an impact on the classicists that you have become? I became acquainted with Hausmann while still a schoolboy. Rochdale Grammar School, where I learned Greek and Latin, possessed only a modest library, so why it should have possessed a copy of the memoir of Hausmann published by A.S.F. Gao in 1936, I don't know. From the moment I read it, I wanted to tread in Hausmann's shoes, and at Cambridge in those days there were still those who venerated Hausmann. They are now all gone. When Corippus was finished, Frank suggested that we should publish a complete collection of Hausmann's classical papers, but there was a problem. In his will, Hausmann had expressed the wish that no such collection should be made, but vanity lay behind this wish. Hausmann's earlier papers show him at his most vulnerable. Ingenuity and invention are there in plenty, but they're not yet under the control of that unerring instinct which puts so much of his later work beyond a sale. Let me tell you a little story about Gao's reaction to the publication. I met Gao only once, not long before his death. He was the last surviving classical colleague of Hausmann's. When CUP agreed to publish the classical papers, we had to decide whether we should inform Gao of our plans. On the advice of a senior officer of the press, who was an old friend of Gao's, we decided not to, since we expected that he would object, and we didn't want to act in defiance of his expressed objection, even though that objection could have no legal force. Instead, Gao's friend arranged that he and I should present a copy of the work to Gao after the event. So, a time having been arranged, we visited Gao in his rooms in Trinity, 
After pausing to admire his collection of French Impressionist paintings on the walls of his outer room, we found him in his sitting room in a bath chair, muffled up. We handed him the three volumes. He turned the pages slowly, and we waited, apprehensive. At length, he looked up and said, Within the limits of my disapproval, I congratulate you. Wow, thank you very much for this and all the other amazing stories. Okay, we've now made it to the third and last section of the interview. So, earlier in your career, James, you published a groundbreaking critical edition of Euripides' tragedies. Cambridge has always been particularly strong in the field of Greek drama, so if you were to single out a colleague working on Greek drama at Cambridge with whom, over the years, you've had a particularly profitable interaction and exchange of ideas, whom would you pick and why? Next to Hausmann, the greatest influence on my work, and the scholar for whom I had the deepest admiration, was Dennis Page. He was an incomparable lecturer and master of an incisive written style. It was he who suggested that I should work on Firethorn, and when I later embarked on an edition of all the plays of Euripides, he devoted boundless time to reading and improving my work. Well, Dennis Page is indeed a legend, so in that sense, at least, your answer doesn't surprise me. Okay, let me ask you a variation on the same question. Among the fellows of Queen's, regardless of their field of research, whom have you particularly enjoyed your association with? I had a particular admiration and affection for John Holloway. Originally an Oxford man, who was a fellow of all souls and taught philosophy. Then at Cambridge, as a fellow of Queen's, he became professor of modern English. He was also a fine poet. He died 20 years ago. Wow, I didn't know this John Holloway, but he sounds like an amazing colleague to have had. Okay, James, now one last question about the present of your research, as we said earlier. So, how does it feel to be able to do other research now that the lexicon is finally over? Are you working on anything new at the moment? Anything that you would like to share with us before we say goodbye? I have two projects in hand. One is a second edition of volume two of my Oxford text of Euripides. It was the first of the three volumes to be published and is now all of 40 years old. The texts of the plays in that volume are in a particularly corrupt state because for the most part they depend on a single manuscript of the Laurentianus in Florence. A good deal of new work has been done on the text in this period, and my aim is to take account of that. And I shall have the excuse to revisit Florence, my favourite city. The other project is a commentary designed for students on the characters of Theophrastus. I published a rather large commentary on this work in 2004, designed for scholars, but students need something more manageable, and I want to make it possible for them to gain easier access to this wonderful but demanding text. So, a revised edition of Euripides II and a green and yellow of Theophrastus' characters. That sounds amazing, James. I'm eagerly looking forward to both. Well, this is the end, so thank you very much for joining us for the first episode of our podcast. As usual, the conversation has been both lovely and enlightening. I hope there will be chances for us to collaborate again in the future, James, and in the meantime, best of luck with your new research, which for sure will bring even more success to an already stellar career. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Gabriele. Thanks a lot for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed listening to this, please give us a good score or write a nice review. This will help us to grow and reach out to as many people as possible. A huge thanks to the Queen's College and the Centre for Manuscript and Text Cultures. Without these two wonderful communities, I will never have found the time, let alone the courage, to make this happen.
And a special thanks to Dirk Meyer, the director of our center, for being so positive and encouraging all the way through. Thank you, Dirk. You're the best. In case the recording didn't make that clear, I'm a very shy person. Truth be told, I've had to fight off all sorts of concerns and anxieties to get myself to do this. Thing is, I tend to stammer a lot when I'm nervous and I really have to concentrate not to do it. So yes, I'm aware that the recording that I'm about to publish is not perfect, but that's what it is, that's who I am, and I really hope you will not dislike it. All the music for this podcast was composed by my friend from Trento, Michele Tazin. Michele is, really, an extraordinary composer and musician, so people, now that you've listened to the podcast, go and check out Michele's Facebook page, you will find the link in the description, and there you'll be able to listen to more, much more, of Michele's amazing music. And lastly, a massive thanks to TDS for providing all the audio equipment for home recording. I interviewed James Diggle on the 7th of January 2021, two days after the sudden and untimely death of Dr. Neil Hopkinson from Trinity College, Cambridge. Dr. Hopkinson was an inspiring teacher and one of the sharpest classes he had met while at Cambridge. It was during the chat with him that I came up with the idea of writing a PhD dissertation on the manuscripts of Cicero's letters, so, in a way, I owe him more than he would ever have imagined. This episode is humbly dedicated to his memory. Thank you, Neil. We're going to all be friends in heaven.